More than 200 police officers carried out a preemptive raid in England early on Monday, arresting 114 people they thought were preparing a protest at the Ratcliffe on Soar power station in Nottinghamshire. On Tuesday, it emerged that while those people were being held, more officers were raiding homes around the country, seizing computer equipment and mobile phone records. Now those arrested but not charged have been released on bail, many with onerous conditions, including bans on approaching power stations or taking place in protests. Campaigners are saying it's an attempt to chill major demonstrations that are planned over the summer. So are anti-terror police tactics coming home to roost? To talk about that and the implications for free assembly and protest on both sides of the Atlantic, we're joined by Mel Evans, an environmental activist with Climate Camp, who've organized a series of anti-global warming demonstrations most recently at the G20 summit in London, and Solicitor Tim Green, who's well known for defending protesters, including members of animal rights groups, some of them facing terror charges. Hi, welcome you both. So let's start with the facts and let me start with you, Mel. Um, quickly, what do we, what can you add to that version of what happened Monday in Nottinghamshire? All I know is that simply these people were, you know, sitting together in a room in a circle calmly and that the police burst in and, you know, arrested them all. They've been released without charge. So currently there is no apparent crime that they're supposed to have committed and nobody so far has claimed any um plan to protest there at that power at that power plant no there's absolutely no details of of what they may have been doing at all to you tim can you describe a little bit the significance of a 200 police officer action in in this town I mean, we're, not, we're not talking about a major urban center here I think that uh, from their point of view, from the police point of view, it makes perfect sense because they just have to occupy 200 police officers for one day, arrest all these people. And their priority then is firstly to gain intelligence through the taking of documents and computers. And secondly, then to get everybody on these very restrictive bail conditions that you mentioned, which effectively stop these 120 people taking part in any protest at all for the next three months even perfectly lawful protests. So from the police point of view, it makes perfect sense. You, you, you occupy those police officers for one day, but for the rest of the next three months, they uh, don't have to worry about um, the people that they arrested on Monday. They, uh, uh, they, they, they are completely prevented from seeing each other, from talking to each other, from going on protests, lawful or unlawful. So uh, I think that is the priority of the police. Tell us a little bit, Mel, about what um, campaigners like yourselves have been involved in in the last few years, because the police are saying there's a real threat to power plants like this one. I think the concern here is that the police are using tactics to try and quench a growing social movement, because as you say, the past few years in this country, climate activism has been flourishing. People have been taking different kinds of actions, um, sometimes breaking the law and being found innocent in, in court cases consequently, um, all against corporations and government decisions which fly in the face of climate science. And, you know, what we've seen is a really a broad base of a movement with people from all strands of society, all different ages, coming together because they want both a space to talk about what's going on in our world and what we need to do about it to create you know fair and just solutions for people across the world and also to take direct action on the root causes of climate change which we're finding to be the the governments and the corporations in this country and the decisions well, that they're we're making looking at some video footage i believe from the climate camp near king's north in kent tell us a little bit about that particular action we set up a you know, spectacular camp with workshops and discussions, sustainable energy devices near right beside Kings North Power Station in Kent. And even before the camp had fully opened, the police were raiding the camp at 4 a.m. They were playing music out of their um, out of their vans. They played Ride of Valkyries. They seemed to be trying to use psychological warfare tactics to, you know, to both. Um, traumatize the campers and to discourage the people from joining in the camp um, and to stop us from effectively setting up so they took away the pipes that we were using to 
um, to get water, clean drinking water around the camp. They took away the structures for the disabled toilet, which are obviously vital to a, a good functioning camp. And and these, you know, these tactics are very practical basis of what we're doing, you know, peacefully holding a camp um, seem to be being used, to, as I say, to quench a growing social movement. Mm. And that's why these preemptive policing tactics are so scary. Now, Mel's, I mean, come, come to you, Tim. Um, some of the tactics that people are talking about here, we have seen before um, in relation, well, certainly to the Irish community in Northern Ireland, um, to the Muslim population in some circumstances, and you've seen them in the context of animal rights protests. Is there a kind of um, normalization, if you will, uh, of a kind of preemptive police, policing strategy that's now coming after the environmental movement. I think that's entirely right. I think they they are moving away from uh, seeing their role. The police are moving away from seeing their role as being to detect and prosecute, set crime, and then prosecute the crime. They're, they're trying to keep it really away from the court system, uh, so that they have as much power as they can to themselves to decide what people can do. So that this is, we have here things, things called antisocial behavior orders, um, which are supposed to happen um, after people are convicted or have been to court. But in, a, in essence, what the police are doing now is taking on themselves the right to decide how people will behave um, and decide how pe who is antisocial and who is not. And by the use of such things as bail conditions in this case, they, in, a, in essence, can stop people from um, doing anything, however lawful, um, that, that they want to do. Mm. Uh, I, I have people who've been on bail for, with conditions that they don't talk to a long list of people. Um, and they've been on bail with these conditions for two years. I now, mean, Tim, uh, some, of these, some of these movements are kind of global. Is there any reason to think that the surveillance techni techniques, some of it very sophisticated, aren't global as well? Is there any reason people here should be afraid? That, that, that they're allowed to have over people's lives, um, which they want to exercise. It, it, I was asking about the connect, international connections. The movements have them. Do the police have them? Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, the, the, I mean in the, you were talking about the animal rights uh, movement. There's a very close cooperation between the British police and the American authorities, and also within Europe in places like Holland and Sweden. That that, 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 that is very clear. That there is now a huge amount of international cooperation, a swapping of information, um, and obviously a huge amount of covert observation through email uh, and the like. Mel, the last word to you. We've got about a minute. What will be the impact of this on, on your plans for this summer's protest? You saw a pretty harsh crackdown at the G22. Are people discouraged? I don't think people are because, you know, we know that this the cause that we're fighting for here is so important and so urgent, and we will continue to be creative in finding ways to have a fair future. What have you got planned? We um, we may, you know, have national gatherings. We have one this weekend to decide by consensus what we plan to do. There is a camp in England at the end of August, one's in Wales and Scotland at the beginning of August. Um, those two near coal sites, the one in England will most likely be near the city of London again because, you know, we're seeing market-based solutions to climate change being offered when actually they're leading us in completely the wrong direction. Mm. So, yeah, Lots we'll find a way. <laughs> All right, Mel Evans, thanks so much for joining us. From Climate Change and Timothy Green, a solicitor from the UK. Thank you both. We're going to keep in touch with this story. Watch it closely. Thanks a lot.